generative textile manufacturing. So the, the, the background to this talk, hang on, I now have to say continue, I think. So th there's a lot of um, general realization that the, the textile and the fashion industry have got a pretty bad footprint in, in many areas really. And so this gets into the popular press quite a lot. The House of Commons issued a very um, substantial report on the whole area recently. So you may have come across this before. And you know, a lot of the blame is put on fast fashion and the large amounts of clothing that people consume. But even beyond that, there, there, are, there are problems. So the fashion industry is responsible for, and this shocked me the first time I saw this, 10% of global greenhouse gas emissions. That's more than aviation and shipping combined, which is quite a thought. It's also responsible for 20% of global wastewater, another really staggering figure. And these are two of the leading um, credentials, if you like, that let us know that the fashion industry really does need to consider change. If we look at the fashion sector in the UK, so it's a big sector generally, it's worth 32 billion pounds to the UK economy each year, employs 890,000 people, so approaching a million. We in the UK consume a million tonnes of textile each year, and most of that ends up, so there's an equivalent, get, an equivalent amount gets into the waste system each year. Most of the textiles and the garments that we use in the UK are imported. There is some manufacturing in the UK of clothing, but most of the textiles are made abroad. And in fact, the majority of the clothing items are made abroad as well. As I said, most of this ends up in the waste sector and a lot of it ends up in waste uh, in landfill and in incineration, which carries obviously a very negative environmental footprint in itself. And the industry or the processes involved in that are, are respons responsible for most of the waterborne microplastics in the environment as well. <clears throat> so even beyond those kind of considerations, uh, a feature of the textile industry, industry if you like, is that they have very non-transparent supply chains. A lot of companies themselves don't have huge certainty into who's produced their, their, the things that they say, ways in which these things produced, are, are produced um, are, are not particularly attractive. So for a lot of cotton um, that goes into textiles, a lot of that's produced in Central Asia, and there are some well-reported instances of forced labor and very poor labor conditions in that part of the sector. Poor worker conditions in textile mills and, and sweatshops are, a very well known, um, particularly in Asian countries, but even here in the UK, it's, it's not unheard of. And then there's the widespread environmental pollution, which I've talked about. And the image at the bottom on the right there shows a river in China. The color of that river is the result of textile dyes. Now, the Chinese are working hard actually to clean up their environmental act, but the, the, the impacts of this activity throughout the world is really verging on the disastrous. So the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, uh, 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 renowned for advocating a move towards a circular economy, and they produced a report on the fashion sector recently, and a lot of fashion, hacks, fashion houses have signed up to the um, principles of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and circularity. But what they've signed up to do is to try and aspire towards it. So the next two slides have images from that Ellen MacArthur report. The first one shows the current state of play, which is a, a, a linear supply for textile production. And the image shows the emissions in terms of greenhouse gases and um, other products as we go along the chain. <clears throat> so the production of fiber for textiles, a lot of it comes from synthetics, i.e. produced ostensibly from oil, and there's a large associated uh, carbon footprint with that. 
but even the natural fibers, I'm wearing a cotton t-shirt that's made from natural fibers, which always sounds good, but cotton is a really um, bad crop in terms of its environmental footprint. So I referred to Central Asia just now, the Caspian Sea has been largely drained to irrigate cotton. There's almost nothing left in the Caspian Sea at the moment. Um, and cause also, in terms of a crop, it, it has the worst footprint in terms of pesticide use in the world as well. Then clothing production, I've already touched on dyeing and the water pollution that's associated with finishing and dyeing in, in the textile business. Go along to use, um, I mentioned microplastics in the environment. So the biggest source of microplastics getting into waterways and into the oceans actually is through your washing machine. And these are microfibers that come out of your clothes when you wash them. And as I said, a large proportion of them are synthetic. Those are things like polyesters and nylon, which are non-biodegradable and can last for tens or hundreds of years. So that, that's causing severe problems. And as I said, after use, eventually nearly all of it ends up in landfill or incineration with obvious consequences. So the aspiration as put forward by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and held by most people is shown in this slide. So if we go around the circle, this is a move towards a more circular supply chain, a circular economy. So they're advocating to phase out substances of concern, particularly microfibers coming from synthetic textiles. There's an aim to increase clothing utilization. You know, a lot of the clothes we buy now are very cheap, they're very poorly made, and they don't last very long, and often actually made not to last long, and there's an assumption that people don't wear them very long because of changes in fashion and things like that. So they're pushing for people to design and make clothes that last longer and to get consumers engaged with their clothing in a different way than they currently are. And then the two areas which um, my talk is mostly concerned with are the third and the fourth. Um, the third is to radically improve the way that we recycle textiles. Currently, it's really very ineffective. I'm going to touch on that again in, I think, the next slide or the one after that. And the fourth one is to make more effective use of resources and, and to move to renewable inputs. So my talk's really focused on this. Improve recycling, more effective recycling great use of renewable inputs into the supply chain. So I said I'd touch on what's the trouble with recycling at the moment. So most recycling methods are mechanically based. So the approach is essentially you've got an item of clothing like my t-shirt here. This is made of natural fibers but these are woven there's a yarn produced which is then woven into this fabric. The fibres in here are very tightly tied into that. They're also dyed and finished, so they're coloured. This one's black. If you mechanically recover the fibres from here, you can only make something black with them. Many items of clothing are actually multicoloured, making this even more problematic. When you try to mechanically recover fibres from textiles, they get very damaged in the process, so they're of low value too. Many textiles are made with polymer blends, which makes that even more difficult. And removing fasteners and zips, um, etc., cetera, is, is extremely problematic. The net result is that reused fibers are of extremely low quality and can be used for a very narrow range of um, poor applications, if you like. So we've been rethinking how you go about recycling textiles. And what this slide shows is the structure of a textile fiber. So I focused on cotton because the talk I'm gonna give you is mostly about cellulosic textiles, which include things like cotton. But the image more or less applies to any textile fiber. So it could be a polyester or nylon, for example. In all cases, the fibers themselves are, are composed of polymers, which are, if you like, um, wrapped around each other to form the large fiber, which you can see with your naked eye. 
if you break that down, you can then start to see these polymers, which I've indicated with the word polymer very cleverly on there, coming out of the fiber. And if we focus down on that, which is shown at the bottom of the slide, and I can use my mouse and point this out, we can start to see that these polymers are basically chains of monomers, small units that are then chemically bonded to one another. In the case of cellulose, these chemical units are actually just glucose. This, that's a, a very simple sugar, one that you can eat if you like. And it's the same sugar that makes up starch actually, but the polymer is different. So it makes a very strong um, resistant fiber rather than a very digestible one. So fibers are made of polymers and polymers are made of monomers. So the next slide illustrates the routes that we're taking to recycle textiles. So we start off here with this old t-shirt. This one's from 1976, few survive that long. Um, this is a cotton t-shirt. So it's principally composed or completely composed of cellulose. And what we can do is depolymerize the cellulose back into the constituent monomers, which as I said, in this case, are glucose, sugars. We can then take those sugars and repolymerize them to make brand new cellulose. So the, we have a picture at the bottom there of some new cellulose fibers that have been produced from the monomers. Make sure it goes the right way. We can then take those cellulose fibers and spin them, spin those, and then weave that to produce a new textile and then fabricate that 20 version of the ACDC t-shirt. I'll just take a side here because um, I shared this talk with my colleague, Alexandra Lano, who works with me on this. And she shared it with her um, partner, Dave. And he said that my use of the ACDC t-shirt was really appropriate because they've been recycling the same song for 40 years. That made me laugh. And then I shared that with my partner, Claire. And she responded that, well, actually, that old DC t shirt in the linear supply chain, we could say it was on a highway to hell. But if we go through the circular economy, here the t shirt is back in black. Now, I apologize for taking time to crack some jokes that I can't even tell if anybody is giggling at or groaning at. Um, and you'd have to know ACDC to have any response to that as well. Anyway, forget my stupid attempts at humor, focus back on the um, circle, the circuit I've, I've drawn here of depolymerizing, repolymerizing, spinning, weaving, and fabricating. And I'll try to walk you through the process as we're working it. So I've already said this, but I'll reiterate it. Our focus at the moment is on cellulosic materials. So these are the things that we would often refer to as natural fibers, cotton, linen, even bamboo people are making uh, clothing out of these days. All of these use plant fibers, which are made of cellulose. And then there are the semi-synthetics, which also make up a fairly big proportion of all the textiles around. And these are made of regenerated cellulose fibers, normally extracted from trees, which are then, that cellulose is then dissolved and then spun into completely um, different fibers with different properties. So usually very attractive properties, different qualities to cotton, for example. And these are things like viscose, rayon, lyocell and tencel, to name a few items. So all of these are cellulosics and all can be broken back down to the monomers that we need to make new cellulose as a way of recycling them. So the feedstocks that we're looking at, um, we're looking at waste textiles, which was what I had on my cycle there. But if we were to just harken back to the circular economy slide from the Eleanor MacArthur Foundation, um, you'd see that we also have an interest in bringing new renewable feedstocks into this circular economy as well. So we've been looking at other waste feedstocks, if you like, 
And these include over on the right hand side, crop residues like wheat straw, which is what's shown here, which is one of our favorite subject substrates for this work. But even we've been working with, munis with municipal solid waste. So the contents of your black bin bag. So we work with a company called Wilson Biochemical. They have a really effective process where they autoclave bad black bin waste. That material then is sterilized in that process and homogenized. The metals, glass and plastic are extracted from it on a conveyor belt. And you end up with a fibrous material, which is basically the residue of all the organic materials and particularly things from paper-based and cardboard-based materials. And that makes up a big proportion of your black bin bag. And that, that fiber is essentially cellulosic. And so we use that as a source of material to produce the glucose to make new cellulose for new textiles as well. So back to the diagram, and I'll tell you about the system we're working on for the depolymerization of the cellulose into monomers. Now you can do this very simply by taking that t-shirt um, and immersing it in concentrated sulfuric acid and heating it to about 120 degrees centigrade, and it will break down into the individual glucose monomers. But you can probably tell from that description that's a very unsustainable process. It's a nasty chemical that you've got to get rid of at the end of the process. It's expensive, it uses a lot of energy, and it really is not a good way to do it. So what we're doing instead is we're using enzymes, which I've referred to here as nature's catalysts. Now enzymes are the molecular machines that make you run. They basically catalyze all of the biochemical processes that build you and produce energy for you to function as a human being. And they're, they're basically the machines that drive all life processes. And what we're interested in is digestive enzymes, enzymes that have evolved um, or has been designed, if you like, through evolution to um, digest things, in this case, back into monomers. So the images on the right reveal the structure of a, an enzyme. So these things you know, are molecular entities. They've got a three-dimensional shape. And the easiest one to look at is probably the B one in the diagram, the blobby kind of gray white one. And so the blobby gray white thing is the enzyme. The blue area is the part of the enzyme in this case, which binds its substrate. And the substrate in this case is cellulose, the material we want to digest. And in the middle of that enzyme, you'll see a red region as well. And this is what's called the active site. It's a site which catalyzes the chemistry. And in this case, that chemistry is to break the bonds between the individual glucose monomers and release them. So this is a, a biocatalyst, if you like, in this case, for digesting cellulose, which is what we want. And on the, on the left, I've got text that summarizes why enzymes are so attractive. So functionally, they speed up chemical reactions. They make chemical reactions happen under much milder conditions than they possibly could do without a catalyst like this taking part. They're highly specific. So this cellulase in the diagram won't digest anything else. It will only digest cellulose. It's evolved specifically to do that job. The key thing is that they work at low temperatures and pressures, and they work in water. So you've got no need to use things like concentrated acids to do this kind of job. The enzymes will do it for you, and they'll do it at low temperature and in water. So these are environmentally benign chemical tools. The next slide shows um, the device that we use for doing this enzyme hydrolysis. So what you can see here is a, um, a cylinder. I don't mean want to do it. Um, but this thing is tumbling, and that's so that we get a lot of agitation into it. And what you can see, the brown stuff in there, is ground up wheat straw with some enzymes added. And when we add them, 
there's very little water there's a bit of water in it to help get things going but it's like a very very thick um, papier mache if you like as the enzymes get to work they break down all the polymers in, 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 in the wheat straw in this case, or it might be in some used clothing as well, and turn this into a liquid solution. At the end, you end up with a, a soup of sugars, principally glucose, which is what we're after. So that will transform that from a solid material into a glucose rich liquid. So that was the depolymerization step to get our starting material down into the monomers, which we've said are glucose. The next step I'll tell you about is how we polymerize that back into new cellulose. To do that, we use a process known as fermentation, which is defined as a process by which you can transform something into something else using microbes. Now the microbes themselves, just like you and me, are running based on a whole series, complex series of enzymatic reactions. And the beauty of using microbes is that they can harness all of those enzymes for the job you want to, them to do. The, the one that we're most familiar with is Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is brewer's yeast. And we've got a picture of the John Smith Brewery in Tadcaster on the right, just to reassure you that this is a very familiar process. So these yeast are used to transform sugars like glucose, which come from malting barley. So the starch in barley gets converted into glucose in that process. And then the yeast ferment that to produce ethanol, which is an alcohol, which is the pleasurable part of beer, if you like, or wine or vodka or, or whatever. So it's the same process used to make biofuels as well. So that's the principle of fermentation. In the case of our work with cellulose, we've chosen to work with a bacterium whose name I can never pronounce. I'll have a go at it and no doubt get it wrong. Comatagaibacter xylinus. Used to be called Acetobacter xylinus when I was young and when I first started working on it. I still haven't got over the name change. You don't need to remember that for any good purpose. The image obviously is a very high resolution electron microscopic image. And you can see there a couple of the cell, a couple of bacterial cells. And these are growing on a glucose solution. And you can see these strands, which are the cellulose that they're producing. And they're producing this big mat of tangled cellulose that you can see in the background. So these bacteria are really effective at converting glucose into cellulose. Here's some pictures on the next slide of them doing exactly that. So these are fermentations being carried out in our lab at York. Basically, we, we fill big shallow trays, we don't fill it, we put a shallow layer of the um, hydrolysate, as we call it, the broken down wheat straw or used textiles um, with the glucose in it. We put that into these big trays under sterile conditions and leave them to grow for a few days. And in the image on the right, you can see the hand of either Heather or Alexandra, who do all the work on this, recovering a sheet of cellulose from the same um, shallow tray fermentation that we run there. And you can see there's a lovely big sheet of this stuff that's been produced by the bacteria. And at the bottom, you can see some of these sheets that have then been washed and dried. And you can see their lovely clean white, what we refer to as virgin quality cellulose, which is then the starting point from which we can start to make our new textiles. So we've got to the, the new cellulose polymers being produced. So how do we then spin and weave that to make um, the, the, the the yarn that can be used then to produce the textiles um, that can be used to make clothing. So the answer to that is we get somebody else to do the next step because our lab doesn't have the expertise. So we have a collaboration. In fact, we have two collaborations, one with the University of Leeds and one with the University of Cranfield, who I'm showing a slide from here. 
And this is um, from uh, Dr. Samir Rahakita, who's a, 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 a good colleague of ours. And he works on developing sustainable ways of producing regenerated cellulose, these viscose-like um, fibers and, 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 and yarn that, that I mentioned earlier in the talk. And what they do is they take the raw cellulose, so this could be the bacterial cellulose that we produce, they then dissolve that to make what's called a, 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 a spinning dope. And that dope is then extruded into a coagulation bath where it more or less coagulates or precipitates to form these new fibers that are then essentially reeled out of that solution. And there you've got your fiber. And depending on the conditions you do this, you get fibers of different qualities. And one of the lovely things that Samir does as well is he includes the dyeing process in the production of the fiber. So he adds natural dyes to the spinning dope. And the one you can see on the left is cucumin, cucumin, I think. And you can see the lovely golden thread that he's produced at the end by the direct incorporation of that cucumin. That's really important because he's cutting out most of that water, waste water that's produced in the dyeing process as well. So we, this is ostensibly a really um, environmentally friendly and sustainable way of producing the fibers for textile application. So you then got the, the, the fibers that you can produce a yarn from that can be then um, used to weave to produce textiles and fabricate to make clothing. And I'm going the wrong way, I apologize. And so, in terms of this, we haven't got this far yet. So in terms of actually producing the textiles, we haven't got that far. You have to remember, we work at the lab scale. So it takes us a long time to produce sufficient textile to then go onto one of these weaving looms that you can see. But we have a collaboration already in place with the London Cloth Company headed by Daniel Harris, which is one of the few companies left in this country that spins, uh, sorry, that weaves textiles. Um, so it's great that we still got technology available. You remember, well, you won't remember, but from history lessons, you'll remember that yeah, this whole textile industry is what made um, our country rich in the um, 18th century. So that, that gives us our favoured route towards textiles that can then be used to make clothing. But on the right, you can see a very odd looking garment that was designed and produced by a fashion designer called Suzanne Lee who's been using bacterial cellulose, very similar um, cellulose to the way that we produce it. The trick here is that the bacteria will produce, produce a sheet of cellulose in the shape of whatever vessel it is you grow them in. So you can essentially grow a panel for a shirt, or in this case, a blouse, which is what Suzanne has done here. Now, that bacterial cellulose um, is a very tough material, but I have to tell you that in its raw form, it's not exactly the most comfortable feeling um, material that I've ever experienced. It's fairly rough. And it's also quite water absorbent compared to what you normally associate with clothing. So it's non-ideal, but you can, in fact, produce the panels and stitch together clothing directly. And as part of the work we're doing, we're looking at ways that we can modify that bacterial cellulose for this direct synthesis, if you like, templating and synthesis of textiles as well. But my instinct from what we've seen so far is that the regenerated cellulose is probably the better route to go. So that brings us, getting towards the end of my talk, and brings us back to the Ellen MacArthur um, circular economy slide. And so I just want to reiterate the point that the technologies we're working on allow us to introduce this kind of radical improvement to recycling by breaking the material down into the monomers and then making brand new virgin quality polymers that we can then bring into that textile thing. We can cut out the use of cotton and stickers as well. And not only produce them from 
old textiles, but also from some of these other things, including municipal solid waste. You can have to persuade people that wearing clothes made out of rubbish is cool, which may take some doing, but you could do it. And the sustainability of doing that is really, really good. The other thing we're doing is making more effective use of um, renewable inputs and, and natural resources. So uh, by using things like crop residues, which have very low value, we can upgrade those into very valuable textiles. And we've done some techno-economic yeah, techno analysis on this, and the numbers look really promising in terms of the cost at which we can produce the cellulose by that route. Finally, um, I keep saying finally, I'll keep saying that for the next three or four slides, I apologise. Um, but we're also looking at a way of broadening this concept, if you like, and I'll just give you a, a brief flavour of it. So this is a, a slide that we produced for a, a project that we got funded recently, which shows the route. So the sort of top half of the top of the image shows the route that I've just described, the cellulosic materials and how those go through the circular um, supply chain then. But we've also recently just started working on technology for doing the same with wool, silks and woolens. I am Dr. Spooner today, I apologize. Silks and woolens are made of keratin. Yeah, These are um, natural fibers produced by animals, either the silk moth or sheep in the case of woolens. I guess not just sheep, but also um, a number of other, other, other animals are used, llamas, etc. Um, and these are very strong, stable polymers, which is why you can use them in clothing. But they are actually proteins. They're made of the same thing as, a, as those enzymes I was describing, but structurally they're very different. And they're made in a way that makes them very tough and very resistant in the environment. But there's one or two odd creatures that have evolved that can eat these things. So the one that we have a, a nuisance in our house with at the moment are, or is the clothes moth. And if you ever get an infestation of clothes moths in your house, you'll know it pretty quickly. They'll eat wool-based carpets. We've got bold areas in our carpets which have been chewed up by the clothes moths. And I've lost a couple of jumpers to them in the last few years. And we're working hard to get rid of them at the moment. But we decided it was also a cool idea to have a look and see how do they manage to digest these materials that are so resistant to digestion. So we've been deconstructing the digestive system used in the larvae of the clothes moth, which is the stage that eats these things. And we're identifying the digestive enzymes that they use for that. And we hope to be using those in exactly the same process, but using silks and woolens rather than the cellulosics in this case. <laughs> and another finally, so just a sort of summary, this um, process that we're working on um, eliminates waste. So we use waste as a feedstock for this process, circularizing that economy. It allows us to use domestic resources. I said at the beginning, most textiles are, are imported into this country now. This way we can actually make our own textiles out of our wastes. That reduces our dependence on imported materials. This process has got a really good carbon footprint. So this fashion sector. The sort of um, approaches I was talking about that Samir is developing in Cranfield will really help eliminate eventually waste water from the dyeing and finishing of the textile fibres. Using these cellulosic based materials in place of synthetics gives us a route to avoiding um, the microplastics. So cellulose particles of course do come off in the washing machine but they're biodegradable and disappear quite rapidly in the water. It gives us an opportunity to, re to reshore a return to the UK textile manufacturing, and that would stimulate clean growth and new jobs as well. My next finally is to say thanks for the funding that's enabled us to do this. And most of this has come from UKRI, so the uh, BBSRC and the EPSRC have both funded projects in this, as has 
the biomass biorefinery network. And at the bottom, I've just indicated something called the Textile Circularity Centre, which has just been funded by the EPSRC in which we're a partner in. This is led by the Royal College of Art in London, and it en encompasses the whole textile supply chain and brings in expertise from the complete supply chain, lots of end users in their fashion companies as well. And is looking at how we can use um, renewable technologies. And the principal one at the base of that whole project is this one that I've just described that we're developing here at York. Um, this has only just been announced, the funding for this. It won't start until January, but there is a temporary website which you could visit if you're interested to learn more about that centre. I'd like to thank the people that did the work. As ever, I love thanking myself, so I put myself in the middle of these pictures. Alexandra Lano and Heather Eastmond are the powerhouses in the lab. They're doing all the work. Samir Rahateka, I introduced you to with his work at Cranfield just now. And I want to thank um, Miriam Ribble at the Royal College of Art and Sharon Bowley, who heads um, the group that Miriam works in there. And they were instrumental in getting us engaged in this sector. They approached us a couple of years ago. They knew that we worked on these sorts of biotechnological applications and said, are there ways you could apply these in the textile sector? And my first response was, I doubt it. But then when we started looking into it, we, we realized we had all the bits to hand more or less that would enable us to do that. And we've spent the last year or so investigating that and it's working out incredibly promisingly, I would say. Finally, um, I just wanted to point up the Bio Yorkshire innovation deal that's being developed, um, not just by the university, but they're leading on this, which the project I just described sits kind of comfortably within that whole concept of using um, renewable technology in the area. And if you go to the Bio Yorkshire website you can find out a lot more deal um, a lot more information on the um, innovation deal which they're negotiating with the government at the moment and finally 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 thank you <laughs> and um, if I can remember how to do it I can answer questions I think Peter you might be going to throw them at me because I at the moment I'm not looking at the Q&A Oh, I can see it. Uh, yeah. yeah. Do you want me to read them or do you want to? No, no, Simon, I need to thank you. And I'm going to give you a quick break whilst I launch another quick poll. Okay. So I, I, I'm launching a poll. Um, so everyone, if you could, if you're willing to participate, it's anonymous, but if you can tell us where you are on your sustainable, uh, your circular economy journey. And I, I've got to do, whilst I'm giving Simon a, a break, I've got to thank um, the Local Enterprise Partnership for York and North Yorkshire um, for, for promoting this event. And um, it's, a, it's a partnership between us. And th this is a poll that um, both we and, and they run for all, our, for all our events related to the circular economy, just to have a pulse check of what's going on. So, um, before I launch into the, the question, Simon, and I'll show you which one in the, the Q&A that I'm going to pick first. Um, and I'm going to ask questions that they seem to be coming up in the areas of consumers, business case and technical. So I'll try and get a few questions in from each of those. Um, we've just had somebody point out about your ACDC uh, T-shirt that you shouldn't be recycling and you should be making a lot of money out of that one. Um, but apparently that's a collector's item, that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. Well, I looked for old T-shirts on, on the internet and that popped up probably because it is a collector's item. <laughs> and then right. decided I needed to find a new ACDC one to replace it. But yeah, you're right, that wouldn't be a good business plan, yeah. <laughs> right. Um, what might be good, if, if you could stop the slides and then uh, people can see you. Oh, yeah, sorry, us. yeah. Um, no, no, it's, it's fine. I was I was using it for advertising future events. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go through um, some of the questions. I'll pick on the the one at the very top, and it might have been answered by the audience already. Um, but it's a question about um, cotton, and um, it, it, if cotton is one of the worst offenders in its um, it, for its carbon foot for its for, sorry for its footprint, 
what materials should we be using for our clothing and, and household textiles currently? Gosh, that's a tough question, actually. Um, There's a lot of tough questions in here. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, one, of the, one of the things I've, I've worked on quite a bit on in the past is hemp. And hemp has been um, heralded as a, a much more sustainable source of plant fibres for textiles than cotton. And it absolutely is. So it doesn't need anything like the irrigation. It produces, I think it produces more fibre per hectare, um, produces a whole range of other things. Needs, one of the key things is that cotton uses a, an enormous amount of pesticides. Um, so it's either that or it's GM cotton, which can reduce the amount of pesticides that you use. So actually, if you want to use cotton, you might want to use GM cotton because that will have a better footprint than organic for sure. Um, but hemp definitely is um, a more sustainable crop and source of fiber. Um, as I said, there are companies using bamboo. I don't actually know what the environmental footprint of bamboo is, but yeah, I, I would advocate hemp based on its environmental footprint, but I'd probably stick with cotton based on its feel. <laughs> so linen is um, sort of similar to, to I think the, fight, yeah, the sort of textiles you get from linen are very similar to the ones that you get from hemp. So that, that, that comes from flax actually. I think its environmental footprint isn't as good as hemp, but I think the textiles are quite similar. Okay. I'm learning stuff all the time. I've been learning things all the way through your, your presentation. Um, there's a question from Andrew at the, at, the, uh, at the very top. Many garments have made, as you pointed out, from multiple um, items such as uh, buttons, zips and studs, but also different fabrics. So um, is there any technology that can separate these components to support recycling? I think not at the moment. I think it is one of the big issues and, you know, it, it is... It, Dispose, even even you know like even just trying to so I was talking to somebody that was in the textile recycling and reusing um, field and even just chopping up textiles is a nightmare um, and getting the fibers out of them is even harder and the zips and studs and things make that you know particularly difficult because they're going to damage any machinery that you do with it uh, and one of the things that you know I, I've thought and we haven't actually tried this yet is that you know the enzyme approach is a really nice one because if you can effectively dissolve the textiles, if you had synthetic zips or metal fastenings and things like that, they should all be left alone. The enzymes, as I said, are very specific. So in, 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 in my ideal world, you could use enzymes to turn the garments into soup, you know, for making new cellulose and leave the zips and fasteners behind. As far as I know, there's nothing currently that works very well to do that job. Apologies, everyone. I realized I'd left the, the poll running, but I've now shared it so you, you, people can see with what the profile of, of uh, people's progress um, with, with circular economy there. I'll leave that up for a little bit and I'll jump on to a, a, another question. Um, and I've just lost it off my screen. Ah, oh, there it is. Um, th this is moving from um, the, 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 the technical side. And just to add before about the, um, the recycling and the difficulties of recycling, I've seen shoes um, going through recycling processes and, and, and the laces are a nightmare to deal with. So <laughs> and, the, and the lace holes are a nightmare as well. Yeah. Um, this is a question about consumers. So what, what can end consumers do uh, to see bio-based solutions become mainstream? So from a consumer pool side. Yeah, now that's really important. Um, so, I mean, one thing you could do is let manufacturers know that you're unhappy with the, uh, if, the footprint of their activities. You know, people have done this. You know, so, you know, NGOs have put pressure on fashion companies to clean up their act in terms of worker rights, particularly pay, use of child labour and things like that. Um, so, yeah, putting public pressure is really important. I think this applies to all the areas of the economy where they're having deleterious impacts on the environment. You know, this is becoming a pressing concern, you know, a, a, yeah, it's a real threat, an existential threat at this point. So putting pressure um, on companies, um, 
working, you know, perhaps buying your clothing from companies who are at least, you know, working hard, you know, and signing up to the Eleanor MacArthur type um, foundation principles, put pressure on them to invest on into producing more sustainably. Um, and, you know, so the textile circularity center that I'm a partner in has got a very large component of um, working with consumers and advocacy to try and get these things through. And so that, yeah, there are quite a few social scientists who are very interested in the ways that um, people can work towards um, seeing a more sustainable future. Yeah, beyond that, I couldn't really say. I'm kind of a nerdy lab scientist more than anything. Okay. He said, he said copping out, yes. Yeah. No, no, absolutely fine. Um, the, the, the zero waste, um, uh, I've just lost it. Zero waste design online sent, sent us a message. So I'm rebroadcasting them, that out about um, the zero waste uh, fashion design um, uh, program. So um, there's something in the chat. Brilliant. Right, um, going back to the questions. Um, Alan is asking, um, it, what you're doing looks really great environmentally. Um, the question is financial. So how does it stack up financially and, and how will regenerative fibre compare to that from a conventional source? Yeah, so this is something that really excited me once we started working on this. So we started working on this project just as, so my group has spent 10, 15 years working in the area of sustainable biofuel production. And so we've, we've worked on the technology behind digesting things like crop residues and waste into sugars and then fermenting them into alcohol to put into vehicles because that has a really, really good carbon footprint. You can reduce emissions better than 80%. If you, if you use municipal waste um, for that, you can, you, you can improve emissions by more than 100%, which sounds illogical, but there's a carbon footprint for the waste going into landfill that counterbalances everything. It looks great. But then when you do the techno-economic analysis, it's horrible. You know, the, the you just, you know, making money out of that is extremely hard without real solid um, government interventions to support that sort of technology, which I believe they should do because of the impact on the environment and the value of doing this. So we, you, yeah, we'd set up some techno-economic analysis around that, which would make me totally cringe and cry into my porridge when I saw the results of it. And then when we started working on this textile project, project we could use that same model because the, the front end the digestion down to monomers is the same. When we did that and put the bacterial cellulose on the front end instead of the um, bioethanol production, what we saw was that the costs from, um, so going from wheat straw, which is probably the most expensive route of the routes that we've described, because you can pay 60 quid a ton for wheat straw, but we could still bring in that bacterial cellulose in at the same price or just below the prices that we could get from the spot market for dissolving pulp, which is the cellulose that's produced from trees that then goes into the regenerated cellulose market. If we use um, municipal solid waste <laughs> we're in a different ballpark altogether and that but that that's because of if you take stuff that's destined for landfill people will pay you to take it off their hands so that changes the economics completely and you can almost make money out of anything out of doing that but you know from wheat straw and and the same from used clothing again the economics is really good there because they have almost no value or a negative value if if you like people will pay you to take it off their hands mm. but even from the wheat straw if we buy that off the um, commodity markets if you like we could make our cellulose um, at a commercially competitive price that really inspires me because we've been trying to get the biofuel stuff off the ground for so long it's become demoralizing and now i can see something and we haven't gone to investors yet we're trying to get to the point where we've made an item of clothing so that we can show people something. But I really think this will work. And I, could, I can see um, the potential for an industry there. 
That's great. I, I've got far too many questions and not enough time. So we'll we'll definitely end at five o'clock if that's okay with you. We'll, we'll squeeze another five minutes of your time. Um, but I'd like to ask a few more technical questions and um, and then move on. Um, just on that theme of, of the, um, the comparisons, um, th there's a question about the costs when you start to look at energy and water, um, compare, comparing recycled to, to, to made from virgin raw material. Um, so there's, there's that part of the question. And another one I'll squeeze in is, why do you need straw in the mix? So what, what's the costs and why do you need straw? Um, well, there, there is a cost associated with that. So I, you know, I, I just hammered on about the struggle we've had to try and make sustainable biofuels cost effective. And that's because the enzymes, well, it's not just that, but the enzymes cost money and you need quite a lot of them to get the product converted, or at least in a cost term, you need quite a lot of them. It becomes a significant cost. Um, so, you know, the, that, that, that bit is expensive, but it allow, allows you to escape from using really nasty chemicals in your processes. So there's an environmental benefit that comes with that. And the cost of enzymes for those applications has come down dramatically in recent years. And as I said, the TEA suggests that we can do that. What was the second part? I've forgotten already. You said there was two parts to the question, I think. There was the, the, the costs when it was talking about electricity and water and the use of ah. straw. So why are we using straw? Yeah. So. Oh, why are we using straw? Um, so straw is available uh, and it does spark controversy because you know, government policy has sort of pushed a lot of straw into power stations. So biomass power stations are a, a real big thing in the UK. And they've, you know, it's gone through a, a rather grotesque situation where sometimes straw is more valuable than grain from a wheat crop um, some years because of a shortage for burning it. That said, um, there are, there is usually surplus straw available. And as I pointed out in my uh, comments just now, our techno-economic analysis says that you know, we can make money out of buying straw at competition with the energy companies for doing that. My only opinion about burning straw for by making electricity is that we can make much better renewable electricity from wind and solar power. But you, know, you can't make new textiles out of solar power, but you can take those organic um, waste materials if you like and you can use those to produce the sugars to make the new textiles so you can decarbonize electricity with wind solar nuclear but you can't decarbonize textiles by that route but you can take that biomass and decarbonize it that way I'm going to, I'm taking a deep breath and say, I'm, I'm thinking, I can't ask any more questions, I'm afraid. We're out of time, but I was going to uh, bring out a question from, I'll read out the question, but I won't expect you to answer it, from <laughs> Helen uh, about samples of, of hemp fibre and the interest in trialling this enzyme process on hemp fibre and whether it could be, you could, it could also be used for um, uh, produced paper fibre. But I, unless you've got a really quick answer or a response to that. Yeah, I'm... sure. Yeah, there's two, there are two quite significant producers locally. Um, Harrison Spinks are more a consumer, but they have a farm. So Harrison Spinks are a Leeds company, make mattresses. They grow hemp. Um, um, ah. <laughs> and there's some people in North Yorkshire whose name's escaping me now. If somebody really wants to know, I can give them the details by email. Mm. So. You should have seen my email address somewhere. It's on the university website. I'm happy to answer those questions better <laughs> by email at this point. Simon, Simon McQueen Mason, thank you very much. That's been a, a, a brilliant hour that we've had with you. Really interesting about the, the technical challenges and, and some of your responses on, on the, 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 the both the consumer as well as the uh, the business case. I've just got to say thank you very much for your um, presentation on sustainable fashion, and to also say that if if people have got questions or comments, then if they can't find quickly way the way around our website, if they just search for your name on a search engine, 
and put York in if necessary. They'll find you and they can email you. There's only one Simon McQueen Mason on Google that I've ever found. So. <laughs> Brilliant. Even better. Even better. <laughs> With that, I just really need to say thank you very much. No, no, thank you very much for inviting me and to everybody that listened. Okay. Goodbye.